Is that sure, we do have a quorum now. Okay, great to hear. Uh, well, we'll just wait until eight hits the dot and then we'll start. Hello, good morning, everybody on the board who's here. Vice chair. Okay, so it is eight. So I'm going to, with my trusty home gavel here, call this meeting to order. So we are here at our executive committee meeting on Friday, May 13, 2022 for Sandag. Um, and before we begin the meeting, I'd like to ask our interpreter, Carlos, to walk us through how to access interpretation services. Carlos? Good morning, Chair. Um, y buenos días. I will begin with the announcement in Spanish and I will be back with the announcement in English. Uh, como indicó la Presidenta del Comité Ejecutivo, se está ofreciendo servicio de interpretación simultánea. Para hacer uso del mismo, por favor, desplácese a la parte inferior de la pantalla de Zoom donde aparecen sus controles. Ahí haga clic en el icono de interpretación, parece un globo terráqueo, y seleccione Spanish o Español. Si está utilizando la aplicación móvil de Zoom en celular, tableta, etc., presionaría primero los puntos suspensivos o más, luego interpretación y luego el idioma. Por último, si no desea escuchar el audio original en inglés en el fondo, por favor seleccione Mute Original Audio o Silenciar Audio Original. Once again, simultaneous interpretation is being provided to and from Spanish. To use the feature, please scroll down to the bottom of the Zoom screen after this announcement. There you will find an interpretation icon and there you would select English as your language. If you are joining through the Zoom mobile app, you would first press the ellipsis or more, then interpretation, and then choose your language. Finally, you would click on mute original audio to not hear the original Spanish low in the background. Gracias and thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, so first we have our non-agenda public comments or member comments. So Francesca, do we have any non-agenda public comments? Thank you, Chair. We do have one in-person public comment. Uh, Catherine Rhodes, if you want to step up to the podium, you'll have three minutes. Oh, wonderful. And if you could play my presentation, please. Hello, this is Catherine. I'm having a hard time hearing. I'm not sure if she's talking. Oh, and I'm and today I'm going to talk about FAA obstructions to navigation. In 2007, the Two High Sun Road Tower near Montgomery Field um, had several of their attorneys on the San Diego County Regional Airport Authority's ATAC subcommittee. Sun Road illegally obtained a City of San Diego building permit for a 12 story structure violating FAA Part 77 obstruction to navigation for airplanes. After the stop work order, Sun Road sued the city for 40 million. The city's land use are stated that if the FAA shut down the airport, then the public property can be sold for workforce housing with new property tax revenue for the city's general fund. I did an investigation that could be found at tinyurl.com slash 2007-0531B. In 2007, I went to the city's DSD and analyzed Sun Road's approved plans. Technically, I found, according to the municipal code, the building was 14 stories, not 12, and 10% over the gross floor area on the approved building permits. I gave my investigation to city attorney, Micah Gary. Um, according to the municipal code, the building was 17 feet high, because of the architectural sloping top story. It created a phantom floor at 15 feet. The elevator penthouse also created an additional floor. Based on legal technicalities, the building permit was violated. Sun Road took down only one story, not two. $40 million lawsuit was dismissed and the airport was saved. This here is the part 77 airspace surfaces for San Diego International Airport. The areas in red is close to where the palm trees are done, and the areas in red is everything above an elevation of 220 mean sea level, which is 200 feet above the airport. Here are the trees that were cut down um, based on a misinterpretation of FAA Part 77 obstruction to navigation. An additional 15 trees are scheduled to be cut down in Bankers Hill and um, Point Loma based on the same misinterpretation. So the solution is to just talk to the FAA um, EO and request a further study to confirm the determination of no hazard to airport and navigation. 
Here is the um, FAA's process. The city stopped on four and didn't do five or six. They missed these steps. The analysis should have done what the city should have done instead of uh, cutting the trees, they should request a further study. They missed the step five, which also includes public notice and comment to people. Period. And they finally, they missed the step six, which is actually getting an aeronautical study for a determination of hazard or a determination of no hazard to airport navigation. And Chair, that concludes the public comments. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so next we have um, consent. Uh, so actually, sorry, for next we have any member comments on exec if anybody wants to make a comment. So put your, go ahead, put your hand up. Okay, I don't see anybody. So now we will go to our consent and I would entertain a motion. Move the consent agenda, Chair. Second. Okay, thank you. We have a motion and a second. So let's go ahead and vote. Thank you for the city of San Diego, Vice Chair Gloria. Aye. For the county of San Diego, Supervisor Anderson. Aye. For East County, Mayor Vasquez. Aye. For North County Coastal, Chair Blakespear. Aye. For North County Inland, Mayor Boss. Aye. For South County, Second Vice Chair Sotelo Solis. Mayor Sotelo Solis, I apologize, I can't hear your vote. If you'd like to put it in the chat, I can uh, announce it for you. Uh, feel free to also text it to me if that's easiest. Oh, there it is. Yes. And Mayor Sotola Solis's vote is yes, so that item does pass unanimously. Okay, <laughs> I heard our little voice, yes. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, so next we're up to item number four, which is proposed final fiscal, fiscal year 23 program budget. So I'm hand, handing this to Andre to go over. Thank you, Chair, and uh, good morning committee members. So in March, we presented the uh, draft budget to the executive committee and the board, which was then distributed to our member agencies, the public and our funding agencies for comment. We have received some comments from the federal funding agencies that we have incorporated into the final budget. We also received some board comments that we have responded to through our board clerk and we have made adjustments accordingly. So today, Melissa, Sandy and I are here to present the final proposed fiscal year 23 budget with a focus on the changes between the draft and final budgets. So the draft budget was $960 million, and I'd mentioned during our presentations in March, that was the first time that we had fallen below a billion dollars in several years, primarily because uh, the completion of the Midcoast project. However, we did receive some additional increased revenues between draft and final, and our proposed budget is now over a billion dollars at $1.04 billion, which is an increase of $80 million between the draft and final budgets. Last month, we brought the board the increased funding estimates from our sales tax sources of TDA and transit funds that will generate several additional millions of dollars for our member agencies and transit agencies. For TDA, the total increase was $23 million, and a majority of those funds go directly to the transit agencies. All of the increases from Transnet go through our budget and a majority is a pass-through. As you can see from the table here, 15.3 million of it will go to our local uh, member agencies, 11.5 million, a combination of the new major corridor transit operations and transit system improvements will go to our transit agencies, 19.7 million will go to our major corridor program, approximately a million dollars to the bike and pedestrian and a million dollars of it will come to SANDAC for administration. 
Now, we are confident for the revenue side of what is coming in from our federal and state and local sources. But with the continued significant increase in inflation, we feel that we should put aside some of this additional funding for unexpected and increased costs. For example, we are proposing to increase our admin budget contingency, our OWP contingency, and for the first time, we will create a board budget contingency too. In addition to increasing the balances in our contingency funds, we're also proposing using some of the additional revenues in our programs. Sandy will now present how those increases, along with the additional revenues we have received between draft and final, and how they impact our OWP, operations and capital program, and will highlight some of the largest changes in those programs. And then Melissa will highlight the proposed changes in our admin and staffing resources. Sandy. Uh, thanks, Andre. Uh, so the first major program in the budget is the overall work program, which includes our data planning and communications projects. This program increased $3.8 million from draft to final, primarily due to adding a million and a half of county funds and for the transit youth opportunity passes and moving a million dollars of federal funding from FY 22 to 23 to reflect the May 1st start date. We also added 331,000 for the San Ysidro San Ysidro Mobility Hub planning project, those were MTS funds, and 874,000 of staffing changes that Melissa will discuss in a bit. Next program is our regional operations and services, which includes the toll facilities, freeway service patrol, and Argus projects. This increased $692,000, also from staffing changes. The biggest program in the capital budget, the annual budget increased $29.5 million. And this includes changes to the multi-year budget, which is detailed in attachment two. A few of the highlights are here on the slide. About $15 million of federal funds is from the Omnibus Bill for Del Mar Bluffs 5, Bayshore Bikeway and Barrio Logan, the Palomar Street Rail Grade separation, and on the Los San Corridor for the Del Mar Tunnel Study. We also added $17 million for the Uptown Bikeway and Eastern Hillcrest. Those are future funds from City of San Diego and Transnet money. A State Route 78 and I-5 Express Lanes connector was part of the future projects list in the draft budget and is now being brought forward into FY23. $3.2 million for the SR125 CMCP project. This uh, $300,000 is programmed in FY23 to complete a tolling analysis. And $3 million for the Central Mobility Hub pending board discussion later this morning. And now Melissa will talk about the board admin budgets and staffing. Thank you, Sandy and Andre. And so I think Andre mentioned in his opening remarks that with the availability of additional revenues this year, we're setting aside a portion of those funds in contingency reserves. So $50,000 for the board budget and $150,000 for the administration budget. So these amounts would be used for any unexpected or increased operational expenses that may be encountered throughout the year. Things like increases to our insurance premiums, um, unexpected need for professional services, maybe upgrades or replacements of equipment. So then uh, to the personnel budget. And wanted to start by providing just a little bit of background about the things that our personnel budget is intended to achieve, and then some of the considerations that have been um, incorporated into preparing the personnel budget for the year ahead. So the, overall, the personnel budget sort of supports three primary goals. Um, it's all about attracting and recruiting the talented workforce that we need here at CNDAG. It's about paying employees fairly and competitively, including uh, providing performance rewards. And finally, it supports our efforts to retain employees. We invest in them. We want them to continue to contribute to the organization. Implementing the reorganization changes that were initiated earlier this year, as well as the current volatility in the labor market, have been the major factors that we've considered in preparing the personnel budget. The directors evaluated overall staffing needs relative to program and project priorities, as well as funding capacity. 
Several positions, including former executive level roles, have been repurposed and those hours reassigned to other roles in the organization. We've also done or identified where there are gaps in skill sets and expertise that we need. And as a result, we are competing for talent in a very tight job market and admittedly finding it difficult to fill certain positions. Employers around the country are addressing the labor shortage in several ways, um, including offering higher salaries. And with the availability of higher salaries elsewhere, it means that some of our employees are being lured away. Sandag's historical turnover rate has been around seven to eight percent. And so far in FY22, this has more than doubled and is now at 18 percent. These challenges are not unique to Sandag, nor are the actions being taken to address the current conditions. And from a budget perspective, several recommendations have been proposed. So starting with uh, compensation, staff have been working with the agency's compensation consultant and four recommendations have been included in the final budget. All are based on market conditions and support the goal of attracting, rewarding and retaining talent. The first two proposed changes are related to the agency's overall salary structure. And these include a two and a half percent increase to all salary ranges as well as movement of about 70 positions to higher level salary ranges. And just a note there, Sandag conducted a salary range study last year, and due to budget constraints last year, not all study recommendations could be implemented right away. Staff had committed to bringing forward a second set of recommendations for consideration. So this is what is being included in the FY23 budget. The other two recommendations retain, uh, excuse me, pertain to employee pay. So in conjunction with the action to increase all salary ranges by two and a half percent, a general salary increase also is being proposed. If approved, each el eligible employee would receive a pay adjustment equivalent to two and a half percent of the midpoint of their salary range. The budget also includes a 3% merit pool for performance-based pay increases. This was included in the draft budget and hasn't changed. T Sandag typically does not provide automatic across the board pay increases for employees. However, with the pace of wage growth, increases in the cost of living and low unemployment rates, the agency risks falling below market and losing more employees if measures are not taken to ensure competitive salaries are provided. With respect to the benefits program, uh, there's one change to mention between the draft and final budgets. The annual contribution to the pension prefunding trust has been restored to $1 million. This had been reduced to 750,000 as part of balancing the draft budget earlier this year. And then uh, to wrap up regarding uh, staffing. So I've mentioned our employee group several times this morning. Uh, and during a conversation with uh, several other directors last week, I in fact described our employees as the heart and soul of this organization, the engine that drives the Sandag machine. Most of them work behind the scenes, and I assure you they're a capable and passionate team and dedicated to bringing your regional vision to life. A lot of work has been done among the leadership team to strategically consider the agency's staffing needs in the year ahead. There are several areas where additional resources and skill sets are needed, and a total of 11 new positions are proposed. Some of these are in the capital program and will continue, uh, will support continued delivery of our, our regional capital programs. Some in our IT group to support implementation of new systems and technologies and support hybrid work arrangements. Some in our diversity and equity, finance and communications team, and then we've also discussed that a new position has been included for the Office of the Independent Performance Auditor. The costs for these new positions are embedded within the various program and project budgets. So I appreciate the opportunity to preview the personnel budget with you this morning. And at this point, we'll turn things back to Andre. Great, thank you, uh, Melissa and Sandy. So. Um, pending your approval today, we'll be presenting the proposed final budget to the uh, Board of Directors at the May 27th meeting. And so the recommendation in front of you today is the Executive Committee has asked to recommend that the Board of Directors 
Adopt Regional Transportation Commission Resolution Number RTC 2022 12, adopting the final fiscal year 23 program budget. That concludes our presentation. Chair, I'll turn it back to you and committee members for any questions you may have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you to the Sandbag team for putting that together and the information. Do we have any questions from the board? I don't see any hands. Do we have any public comments? We don't have any public comments on this item. Okay, then I would entertain a motion. Our vice chair, do you have your hand up? Well, just to make comments, chair. Um, yes. If there, yeah, if there's no comments from the public, happy to, to dive in. First of all, I just wanted to express my appreciation to staff. Um, I've been watching my own city staff try and develop our budget. This is a very difficult time to do that, um, both with the fluctuations uh, in finances and the economy, coupled with the real challenges Melissa was laying out with regard to staff. I'm grateful the organization has been forward thinking and trying to address the need for staffing. Uh, board members show up on Friday afternoons. I recognize the agency is operating seven days a week um, and the need to retain talent it's really important. I think all of us probably have this in our own jurisdictions. Um, so I was curious to see how we might try to address it. And I think what was proposed here is extremely reasonable and reflective of where um, the markets currently are uh, in terms of talent. Um, it's it's a hell of a time, right, to find to find folks. And uh, we have big plans uh, around Ota Mesa East and other big challenge, uh, big projects. We need staff to do it. Um, so I'm grateful that we have some additional revenue to be able to make that possible. And again, appreciate staff laying it out uh, so clearly. Actually, I would say I've seen a lot of Sandag budget proposals. This slide presentation I think is extremely um, understandable, uh, and uh, I think we should strive to do as much as we can to, to make our documents as understandable as possible. So thank you for presenting it in a way that I think the uh, average San Diegan could could figure or uh, understand. Um, beyond that, you know, Chair, we have other things to do today, although nothing's more important than our budget. Um, again, I appreciate the way that we have multiple bites of the apple uh, in terms of our budget development. Um, I think the modifications from the last time we were shown to now are, are understandable, reasonable, um, with the contingencies that are put in place, recognize there's a lot of uncertainty. Probably the only question that I would have um, would be with regard to capital uncertainty. I'm, uh, I mean, uh, I need to say project costs. I recognize that a lot of the capital projects, the city of San Diego are coming in way over um, uh, budget, uh, just materials, staffing, whatever else. Uh, can staff just sort of talk through that particular risk that we look at in this budget, how you're accounting for that? Uh, and if there's anything we should be anticipating or watching as board members through this next fiscal year. Sure, if I could address that, um, Mayor. So yes, obviously the capital program is our biggest program that we have over 85% of our revenues. And so annually what we do is a plan of finance that staff has actually undertaken right now to basically see what kind of revenues are coming in, which I think we're fairly comfortable with what's coming in. The other side of the ledger is the costs. And so right now all the um, program managers are looking at each of their programs, developing their costs, and obviously we're seeing some increases. And so we will be coming back with the plan of finance to the board probably in the fall sometime. And if there's adjust, any adjustments that need to be made in the budget at that time, we will. However, as I've stated, um, you know, we have bolstered some of our contingencies and with the additional resources coming um, from the sales tax, those are also flowing into contingencies as well that we may have to use and we'll come back to the board, um, like I mentioned, probably in the fall to make any adjustments if necessary. If I may, um, uh, Mayor, this is Hassan. I'm going to add to what uh, Andre said. And that you, you ask a great question that the whole country, the whole world is actually facing because of all kinds of issues, not only inflation, but supply chain. We use the best estimates uh, today, and I am almost certain this is going to change. That's why we will come back to you regularly to update you on 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 the cost uh, aspects of, of the capital program. Having said that, I also uh, want to caution that sometimes, um, you know, uh, I mean, we're, we're, we're hoping, more than hoping, we're working really hard to bring in additional federal and state resources. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes you say, okay, you bring in new resources and now it's all going to be eaten up by cost, but that's, that's life. But uh, today you're seeing uh, the capital estimates at the best what we have today. That could change next month or the month after. 
um, we'll see. But uh, I also want to remind you that the cost has been going up even before the inflation and the supply chain issues. Uh, I mean, I think a few months ago, before Jim Lithicum left, he presented to you that uh, we never seen this um, increase in, uh, in the growth of the cost of project period. So I'm not expecting that to die down. Thank you, Hassan, and I appreciate staff's uh, response. I think what this agency does best is deliver projects to our region, um, and you recognize that all of us want to see that progress in our respective jurisdictions to the extent that these cost increases would impact our ability to deliver. I think we'd all like to just know that um, and to be able to manage our constituents' expectations. Uh, again, because I think this is what we do great. I mean, look at the number of projects that all of us have been part of in terms of bikeways, the trolley extension, uh, some of the freeway uh, ex uh, carpool lane expansions. Um, so I just want to make sure we continue to deliver. I know that you will. I just recognize that there's a lot of externalities that are going to make that even harder. Uh, but I do think this team is up to the task and further and, and further justifies uh, the increases that are proposed in order to maintain the highly skilled professional staff that we have. Uh, Chair, I, that was the only question I had for this. I'm happy to move uh, the, the recommended action uh, that's in the uh, Board packet. Uh, encourage my colleagues' support. Okay. So tell us only a second. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the motion and the second. And we'll go to Mayor Jones. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. So I, I just wanted to bring attention to the eight point four eight million dollars that we're spending on administration, which happens to ironically be the same amount of money that we're spending on bike, uh, pedestrian and neighborhood safety initiatives, which is, is kind of ironic that we're spending that much in administration, but of that administration, we're only adding one uh, position to the uh, independent auditor's office, which you know I've brought up a few times uh, because I think it's very important that we have a lot of transparency moving forward. And I don't know if one is enough because I, I pretty much, I, I think I recall um, that that she was saying she needed more positions than one. And so I'm not quite sure why it's just one that we are uh, going to be funding. So that's a question. And then also uh, wanted to, um, you know, just kind of mention that, you know, of those, well, actually a second question I, I should say, and that is, is of those of uh, the $8.4 million or $8.48 million, is that um, administrative uh, positions within the agency or is that also consultants? And so if we could have a breakdown on that, I think that would be helpful to feel, uh, to feel better informed. So, so Mayor, Mayor Jones, uh, thank you for your questions. The first question on the independent performance auditors, uh, she requested the position we accommodated, if she requests more, we'll look into it. Uh, just reminding the board that we're, we have about 60 vacancies, including vacancies in the performance independent officer that we're trying to fill. Um, it's, it's a hot market right now, but uh, I have not received any additional request from the performance uh, auditor or, or the audit committee for that matter. And we were always being accommodating because we agree that we, th this agency needs the performance independent officer, but we, we, we accommodated the request given by, and I believe Mary Kay is online. Uh, she, she is. Oh, she's not, okay. Uh, but we, we have not said no to, to the needs for the performance independent officer. Uh, on the second part of the question, I'm gonna let Melissa uh, and Andre actually, Andre handle this one. Thank you. Know, you. Um, thank you, Mayor Jones. The uh, administration budget is actually $18.9 million of which 10.5 million is personnel. And the balance of it is, you know, keeping the lights on, the rent, um, insurance, telecommunications, et cetera. We don't have any um, consultant um, dollars in there. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mayor Jones. Um, and so I don't see any other hands up. Um, so let's go ahead and vote on the motion. Thank you, Chair. For the City of San Diego, Vice Chair Gloria. Aye. For the County of San Diego, Supervisor Lawson Reamer. Aye. For East County, Mayor Vasquez. Aye. For North County Coastal, Chair Blakespear. Aye. For North County Inland, Mayor Voss. 
Aye. And for South County, second Vice Chair Sotelo Solis. Sotelo Solis, aye. Thank you, and that does pass unanimously. Okay, thank you. So our next item, I think we're gonna hear from one of our board members, Supervisor Lawson Reamer is going to start us off on our legislative status report. So um, there's a requested action of support for a bill that's being carried by um, Council or um, Assemblymember Ward, AB 1640. And so we'll hand it over to Supervisor Lawson Reamer to explain what this is about. Um, uh, Chair Blakesford, I'm happy to talk about this. I, I do know uh, quite a bit about it, but I actually think I'm supposed to talk about um, uh, Assembly Bill, uh, I'm sorry, Senate Bill 1105. Um, oh. But I can do both. You'd okay. Like. Well, whatever you would like to talk about, I encourage you to. <laughs> um, so let me start with um, the Senate Bill 1105, which um, is what uh, the, the subcommittee, the uh, Regional Equitable Housing Subcommittee has been looking at. Um, so Senator Wesso um, has proposed a bill that uh, that kind of builds on uh, bills that have been passed in the last few years, one in San Francisco and then kind of in, in the Bay Area and then another uh, initiative that uh, was proposed last year and is still uh, under consideration um, now in the Assembly for Los Angeles that looks at creating um, regional housing finance authorities. And so uh, what Senator West has been moving forward at, with a lot of input from the subcommittee and a lot of uh, task force members is um, doing something similar for San Diego, but really designing it to meet the needs of San Diegans. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, a lot of similarities to what's been done in the Bay, but also a lot of distinctions and differences that really looks at what makes sense for our region. Um, and it's been a really incredible process. I just want to, you know, thank uh, the other members of the subcommittee, um, you know, including um, the the vice chair, who's also on this call, which uh, Mayor Todd Gloria, um, as well as uh, Jack Shu and Alejandro uh, Sotelo Slees and and uh, Lisa Hebner, um, keeping the process moving. But we've also been consulting with over forty stakeholders, kind of across um, industries, everyone from Habitat to, to for Humanity to the building trades. It's just been a really um, kind of diverse um, and interesting and wonderful process um, kind of moving forward. And I think we've we've made really great progress. Um, I think there's a lot of consensus um, in terms of what a housing finance authority should look like for our region um, and what we need to do for San Diego in particular and still sort of hammering out some of those details. Um, but um, at some point soon, I think it probably in the next meeting, we'll be ready to, to, to bring something forward uh, for um, the board to endorse um, in order for us to take a position on uh, Senator Wesso's legislation um, that's really been shaped by the input of this housing subcommittee. Um, so I, if there's other questions, I can dive into further details, but I think top line and the most important things to note are that it's moving in the legislature uh, that there is a bill moving, um, it's really being shaped by the subcommittee and by this consultative process. And at some point quite soon, we will be, be asked to take um, a position and formally to endorse it and support it um, so that we can uh, help drive that forward in Sacramento. Okay, thank you. So let's just, let me just uh, circle back to the ward bill. Is that related to this at all? Um, so I can, I will talk about this bill a little bit. And then I think, um, there, I think, let me say, there's someone else who's supposed to jump on. Um, I'm looking at my notes, uh, who said that they would, would or, talk about, this. but, and let me just ask you, so, because the bill you were just describing the Senate bill, we're also talking about that at the board meeting, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. And so, so mm -hmm. go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, that's right. It's the same bill that we're talking about at the board meeting. And then with the cent, this um, Chris bill, Chris's bill um, is, is, you know, I think very big picture. We, uh, you know, that he has put forward a bill that looks at how we can have regional coordination on climate action and, you know, acknowledges that we as individual jurisdictions really are not going to make progress on climate acting alone. And um, his bill enables uh, jurisdictions to come together to work together on um, climate 
uh, broader climate plans. Um, and one of the places that that could be situated, it, it has to be at an agency with multiple jurisdictions, and it could it could sit at SANDAG. It doesn't necessarily have to, but if the um, if the bill passes, it could it could sit at SANDAG, um, and so it would be like an additional. Um, an additional uh, power. I think um, the person who is supposed to be speaking to this is Hector. Okay. Yeah, I think staff Anna and Hector are prepared. Um, and I think maybe Anna's going to speak to this. Um, thank you for the little preview about it. Um, and we'll. So well, I'm so, excited but, about the bill. So I'm very yeah. supportive of Chris's bill, but I don't want to steal Hector's. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. So with that, we'll hand it over to Sandeg staff to take the rest of the legislative program description. Thank you very much, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Lots of things are happening uh, when you think with a borders perspective. Uh, think while the Rus Russia Ukrainian co conflict is escalating in faraway latitude, the humanitarian crisis at our border is escalating too. Our neighbors have for many years housed thousands of San Diegans that cannot afford our housing market or simply choose to, look, to live in Mexico. And for some time, uh, our border has attracted thousands seeking refugee and humanitarian asylum from Central America, the Caribbean, South America. And now Russians and Ukrainians are coming here to our border. This is a very complex situation impacting the San Diego and Tijuana region. And to add to that, the city of Tijuana is now experiencing a consequence, serious mobility crisis where traffic and congestion are becoming almost permanent condition in, in their city. Both crises have a compounding effect. We have heard that uh, regulations of Title 42, the federal public health order restriction that, that restricts asylum seekers from entering the United States while they are uh, processing their cases, uh, that could be lifted on May 23rd or may, retain, may remain in place uh, due to judicial decision. Certainly, it will continue to be an important matter for our communities, but please, please note, anything means that the border is open, but more flux of uh, migrants might be coming on our way. And trade is continued to grow in billions of dollars and in the number of trucks. For the first quarter of this year, Mexico was the largest trading partner to the United States. Of course, it is the largest for California. Remember that uh, before NAFTA, Mexico was the fourth or the fifth trading partner. Now it is in our top partners, uh, fighting you know, this rank with China. Uh, with this new uh, USMCA, uh, this positive trend will continue, but not without impacts to our border our border communities, of course. So uh, San Isidro and Otay Mesa live with highest exposure to traffic impacts to, uh, to PM 2.5 emissions across the state. Earlier this month, CARV announced it is partnering with the city of Tijuana to install 50 air monitoring stations donated by the state of California to gather and exchange very much needed air quality information. Also, the county of San Diego, as uh, Supervisor uh, Tara Lawson mentioned it, held its first meeting to launch the work on the AV617 program for the international border communities, in which APCD will work with the communities to develop on an emission reduction plan for the areas of San Isidro and Otay Mesa. As you have been informed, SANDAG is collaborating in this effort and a report will be presented by APCD in the next Borders Committee meeting on Friday, May 27. And uh, US-Mexico bilateral relations have been active also. On April 29, the two presidents, Biden and Lopez Obrador, held a telephone conversation to discuss shared goals in the line of to the high-level economic dialogue with a special focus on nearshoring North American supply chains. Again, a topic of special interest for our region. During the restrictions on the land border crossings, trade production lines were protected and operated normally. As I said before, our region even experienced increase in, in the flow of trade. 
And also earlier this week, actually yesterday, the two countries held government-to-government -government discussions in Tijuana to align at a federal level infrastructure priorities along the entire border from the Gulf of Mexico to the Pacific, but also addressing law enforcement topic. And in this context, and with the permission of Vice Chair Tal Gloria, I also like to mention the signage of a memorandum of understanding between the cities of San Diego and Tijuana to increase collaboration, but also to address sensitive topics such as the Tijuana River and border crossings. Congratulations, Mayor Gloria. Also, our CEO, Ikrata, I believe he already mentioned the importance of continuing collaborating with our neighbors, making the most of our competitive advantages. Our CEO, Ikrata, and our deputy CEO, Colleen Clemenson, met with shareholders of Tijuana's International Airport to witness the modernization and expansion, expansion of the passenger facility in, in Tijuana. Before CVX was open, Tijuana's airport managed about 4 million passengers a year. Last year, even with the pandemic in 2021, the Tijuana airport served almost 10 million passengers, and it is anticipating that the airport will serve more than 17 million passengers by 2034. Also, continuing on the bilateral relations briefly, let me mention that next month in June, President Joe Biden will be hosting in Los Angeles uh, the, the Summit of the Americas for multilateral discussions with countries of our hemisphere. And let me just conclude by mentioning that next week, we will celebrate Back to Work Day in San Diego. Our neighbors will again uh, host a parallel event, Tijuaneando and BC, to tie together our celebrations, but also to call the attention to opportunities for connecting our region with shared bike routes, a great alternative for the current mobility crisis on the border. And with this, I conclude my report and I pass the word to my colleague, Anna. Thank you, Hector. As many of you know, we're in the middle of a very active legislative session. At the April 8th Executive Committee, you approved the sponsorship of three bills and the support of another. Today, I'll provide you with an update on those bills and share another bill of interest. SANDAG took a sponsor position on Senate Bill 985 by Senator Hueso. This bill would amend existing statute, which allowed for the construction and operation of State Route 11 and the Otay Mesa Port of Entry. SB 985 provides the necessary authorities to ensure the project is completed on time and in accordance with current standards and agreements. Yesterday, it passed off the Senate floor on the consent file, which is like an item on our agenda being approved on consent, and it will now head to the Assembly. Sandag also took a sponsor position on Assembly Bill 2367 by Assemblymember Ward. This bill would clarify SANDAG's authority to implement and exercise its bonding authority for all components of the regional plan, including the authority to plan, engineer, design, and seek funding sources for projects such as habitat conservation, water quality improvement, and other environmental mitigation. This bill provides the clarity necessary for SANDAG to achieve its regional plan commitments. Early last week, it was unanimously passed off the assembly floor without any discussion and is now on to the Senate. The third of the bills Sandag took a sponsor position on is Assembly Bill 1833 by Assemblymember Ward. This bill will align the micro purchase and simplified acquisition thresholds for Sandag, MTS, and NCTD with those at the federal level, as well as with state and federal law, which would further support MTS, Sandag, and NCTD in streamlining administrative activities to reduce cost and expedite project delivery. This bill is going to the Assembly 4 for its third reading on Monday and is expected to pass out of the Assembly and move on to the Senate. Sandeg also took a support position on Assembly Bill 2753 by Assembly Member Reyes. This bill would establish a digital equity bill of rights for all Californians and require the California Public Utilities Commission to ensure that all residents of the state benefit from equal access to broadband internet services. The, board, the Sandag Board of Directors has taken strides to demonstrate Sandag's commitment to ensuring equitable, accessible, and rapid broadband deployment and adoption throughout the San Diego region. These strides include the adoption of a resolution to develop a regional strategy and the regional digital equity strategy and action plan. AB 2753 supports these efforts by establishing a statewide commitment by facilitating equal access to broadband internet services and requiring that any rules adopted promote equal access to internet service. 
This bill is set to be heard at the Assembly Appropriations Committee on Wednesday, May, 9, May 18th. From there, it should go on to the Assembly floor where it's expected to pass out of the Assembly and move on to the Senate. One more bill for you all today, and Sandag, is, uh, Sandag staff have been monitoring the la this last bill that I have for you, which is Assembly Bill 1640 by Assemblymember Ward for your consideration, and I appreciate the, the, um, the tee up by, by Supervisor Lawson Reamer as well as Chair Blake Spear. Um, this bill will authorize the establishment of a regional climate of regional climate networks, which would foster regional scale climate adaptation and resilience that prioritizes the most vulnerable communities through collaboration on adaptation and resilience solutions. These networks would also support the development of regional climate adaptation and resilience plans. Sandag has been actively working to reduce the climate impacts facing the region for over a decade. The 2021 regional plan includes programs, policies, and plans that will help reduce climate impacts through mitigation, adaptation, and resilience. AB 1640 is consistent with Sandag legislative program goal number 12, which helps to implement climate measures included in the 2021 regional plan. And this bill is set to be heard at Assembly Appropriations Committee on Thursday, May 19th. From there, it should go to the Assembly floor, which also was expected to pass out of the Assembly onto the Senate. Today, the Executive Committee is asked to approve taking a support position on AB 1640. That concludes my presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, well, thank you so much for all that information. Uh, do we have any questions from the board? I don't see any hands. Do we have public comment questions or comments? Thank you. We do have one virtual public comment. Uh, Noah Harris, you can go ahead when you're ready. Good morning, uh, Chair and committee members. This is Noah Harris with Climate Action Campaign, dialing to comment in support um, of AB 1640 and regional climate action. As the climate crisis accelerates and impacts San Diego County, it is critical that the region organizes and works together to protect the people and places we love. Assembly member Chris Ward has authored a bill, AB 1640, that would direct the state OPR to develop guidelines for regions to establish regional climate networks to advance climate policies, projects, and programs. Regional climate networks may, may be standalone or housed in existing agencies such as SANDAG to support cities in their efforts in climate planning, attract federal and state funding, and sharing best practices amongst cities and agencies. We hope SANDAG will help by supporting AB 1640, assuring its passage and working as a region to, ter to determine how best to establish a regional climate network for local decision making on climate related issues. We need regional climate solutions as soon as possible, and AB 1640 will be a big step toward that effort. Please support AB 1640 today. Thank you. And that concludes the public comments. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mayor Gloria. Thank you, Chair. I believe we're asked to uh, take a support position for Assembly Bill 1640 uh, by staff. Is that right? Yes. Um, happy to make that motion um appreciate the assembly members leadership uh, on all issues but particularly climate uh, and then just appreciation to hector uh, and to anna for the presentation as always and hector thank you for uh, highlighting the uh, my visit to tijuana earlier this week uh as you mentioned a lot of issues on the border i'm just grateful that sandag's uh, so engaged particularly with regard to otan mesa east um, for some of the border wait times we're not happy about it they're not happy about them either um, but we're working on a constructive binational solution to that. Um, and again, appreciate uh, your, your uh, constant eye uh, on our U.S.-Mexican relationship and keeping the board abreast of what's going on down there. So, Chair, again, happy to make that motion uh, and appreciate staff's report. Okay, thank you. I'm going to second it. Um, and But I did have one question. I saw in the newspaper this morning there was a nice article about CBX um, and how um, popular it is and, and well used. And then at the end of the article, it said that there was um, a proposal, it's, it quotes Hassan or it references Hassan saying that there's an effort to connect the two airports that would potentially take about five years. And I'm just curious about like what specifically connects the two airports? Because I know there's a shuttle that goes between the two, but what is it that we're talking about when we're referring to connecting the two airports? 
So, Chair, this is Hassan. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, and I did speak uh, to the Tribune at, the, at CBX, Colleen and I were attending. Um, this is the purple line, if you recall, we have in the five big moves, the purple line goes from CPX through San Cedro uh, all the way to, uh, to downtown. So that, that was the line that was referenced. I see, okay. So it would be connecting through fixed rail that's not currently there, uh, the two airports. And this is the purple line, uh, an underground line. And, and when we uh, were planning that, we have discussions with uh, the CEO of CBX or he and other officials that they were willing to reserve a space uh, for, for the future station. Okay, okay. Okay, great. Thank you for the answer. Um, and let's go ahead and vote on the motion. Thank you for the city of San Diego, Vice Chair Gloria. Aye. For the county of San Diego, Supervisor Lawson Reamer. Aye. For East County, Mayor Vasquez. Aye. For North County Coastal, Chair Blakespear. Aye. For North County Inland, Mayor Voss. No. And for South County, Second Vice Chair Sotelo Solis. Aye. Thank you. And that item does pass with five yeses and one no. Okay, thank you. So this, this is the end of this meeting. So our next meeting is on June 10 at 8 a.m. And we will see everybody in 10 minutes uh, over at the other meeting. So thank you very much. And this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>